Hi everyone. Welcome back to our discussion on American imperialism around the turn of the 20th century. As always, please make sure and study the lecture terms to prepare for the unit exams. As we begin our discussion, it would be helpful to get a working definition of what imperialism was. Imperialism is the policy of a nation seeking to extend its cultural power, its economic power, its political reach, usually via military intervention with other countries across the globe. And in fact, the term imperialism might sound a lot like empire, and that's another way of thinking about it, the process of empire building. For much of our nation's early history, imperialism was not something that many people thought about. In fact, Americans didn't really think about foreign policy at all. We were otherwise preoccupied, you might say, during the 19th century with a lot of internal issues that needed to be resolved. Think the Civil War and the resulting devastation that had to be cleared up during the Reconstruction era. The 19th century was also a period of rapid urbanization as cities are growing in size. We've got westward expansion. We have the increasing advances of industrialization here in the United States, as well as issues related to immigration. So all told, many Americans didn't, frankly, give much thought to the United States reaching out and trying to extend its influence abroad. We simply had too much on our plate domestically for much of the century. That will change, however, by the 1880s and 1890s. We're seeing technological advances such as the laying of the first transatlantic telegraph cable in 1856, diminishing America's physical isolation from the rest of the world. What used to take 10 days to receive information from the continent of Europe to the United States now took a matter of mere minutes. We also see advances in steam technology, steamship technology. The steam turbine engine along with screw propeller technology will dramatically speed up the transatlantic ocean voyage from the United States to the continent of Europe. This too sort of brings the world into greater focus for many Americans. For those that could afford it, Many Americans are also deciding to travel abroad during this period. This, too, uh, lends a sense of interconnectedness, culturally speaking, with the United States and many foreign countries. And certainly, by the late 19th and early 20th century, the U.S.'s economy is becoming ever more intertwined with the global economy. Also, Americans are watching what's going on in other areas of the world regarding imperialism from other foreign powers, such as Britain, Italy, Spain, Germany, Japan. There are a number of other countries that are extending their global reach during this period and actively establishing colonies in other areas of the world. This is the age of empire building. Perhaps you've heard the phrase, the scramble for Africa. As you can see from the map here on the slide, you can see that the continent will be overrun by a number of foreign powers during this period with disastrous consequences for the people on the ground. The same thing is happening uh, in East Asia as well during this period. For some American businessmen and politicians, they're looking at what's taking place and they're saying, well, if Portugal can establish colonies overseas and build a, a foreign empire, why can't the United States? Why, in other words, are we sitting on the sidelines while other powers are taking advantage of this land grab internationally? As a result, you're going to see the, uh, uh, the increasing influence of a number of very wealthy financiers and, and industrialists and politicians during the late 19th century that deem themselves expansionists. Uh, these are individuals who want the United States to go ahead and get involved in this international competition to acquire territory overseas. However, through much of the United States' early history, isolationism was the practice that most politicians had advocated. This was the notion that the United States should take care of its own domestic business and trade freely with other nations, but remain 
outside of international geopolitics. In other words, isolationists were happy to trade American goods abroad, but they were not interested in becoming politically or militarily entangled with other nations. And it's this isolationist impulse that really guided much of U.S. policy, at least until the late 19th century, where we start to see the expansionist holding far more sway in the executive branch as well as the legislative branch of our government. So what was the benefit of empire building? I want to take a few minutes to talk about some of the most commonly cited motives for these expansionists, these advocates of imperialism during the period. We'll begin with the argument that acquiring overseas territories would be a great engine for growing the U.S.'s economy. One benefit of acquiring territory overseas is acquiring the natural resources that come from the takeover of this territory. Now the United States has always been very rich in natural resources so this was not a primary uh, argument of many expansionists during the period but it was something that they pointed to uh, that other countries were certainly experiencing the benefit of. Think for example the British in South Africa with the discovery of diamond mines. More importantly, you, you will see expansionists arguing that the United States needed to open up new markets for American-made goods to sell abroad. Indeed, as the industrial economy continued to grow exponentially during this period and advances such as the assembly line process began to speed up the production of everything from automobiles to toasters during this era, what you're seeing here in the United States is market saturation, meaning that you know, households only typically need, for instance, one toaster. And once everyone in the United States has a toaster for toaster manufacturers, they need to find someone else, a new market to sell their goods in to keep growing their business. As one of the most prominent advocates of expansionism during the period, naval theorist Alfred Thayer Mahan remarked, quote, Americans must begin to look outward. The growing production of the country requires it. And clearly the American government agreed. Exports of American manufactured products rose substantially after 1880. And by 1914, American foreign investment already equaled 7% of the nation's GNP. Companies such as Kodak Camera, Singer Sewing Machines, Standard Oil, International Harvester were quickly becoming multinational organizations during the period, opening up branch offices in growing overseas markets. Specifically, American industrialists looked hungrily at the prospect of opening up their goods for sale in the most densely populated area of the world, that being China. For example, American Tobacco Company, headed by James B. Duke, after the invention of the cigarette rolling machine in 1881, Reportedly, he was flipping through a world atlas to survey the population of foreign countries when he came across the population total in China at that time, which was 430 million individuals. He exclaimed, quote, that is where we are going to sell cigarettes and sell cigarettes. He did. In 1890, the Dukes exported their first shipload of cigarettes to China, and only 12 years later, sales to that region had skyrocketed to 1.23 billion cigarettes per year. So there were some enormously lucrative business opportunities available to U.S. businessmen who were willing to sell into these newly opened foreign markets. In addition to the lure of profit, another push for imperialism was based upon plain old national pride. During this period, as nations were going abroad to conquer territories and bring them under their control, um, the notion that developed among many of these competing nations was, look what we've done. We have an amazing military. How else could we have done this? We have an amazingly strong economy, right? It was a point for many of these countries to sort of brag on themselves 
the evidence that they were able to reach out and take over territories thousands of miles away from their home country, they thought was evidence of how wonderful their civilization was. So for American politicians and American expansionists, they said, again, why shouldn't the United States show the whole world what we are capable of? Aside from the desire to achieve international fame and acclaim for taking over territories overseas, another push for American imperialism was related to the dramatic growth and size of the U.S. military, in particular the Navy, during the late 19th century. As expansionist senator from Indiana, Albert Beveridge declared in 1898, it was just a matter of time before the United States shall, quote, cover the oceans with our merchant marine. We shall build a navy, he said, to the measure of our greatness. And American law, American order, American civilization, and the American flag will plant themselves on shores hitherto bloody and benighted, henceforth to be made beautiful and bright. Beveridge's speech clearly supports the economic motive for imperialism and even a cultural motive for that, but he also very specifically calls out uh, the U.S. Navy, that it was time for the United States to build a navy, he said, quote, to the measure of our greatness, unquote. Clearly, Washington, D.C. was listening. Naval expenditures rose dramatically by the U.S. government during the late 19th century. For instance, in 1890, naval expenditures made up just about 7% of total federal government spending. However, by fiscal year 1914, just 24 years later, that figure had all but tripled as naval expenditures rose to 19% of all U.S. government spending. That's almost one out of every five dollars being spent by the U.S. government just on building up its navy. The thinking was, if you want to reach out and touch other areas of the world, then you need to have the ability to do so. To project power across an entire globe, you need to have a navy to do so. Also, if you'll notice the map that I have here on the slide, look at all the tiny tiny little dots in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that the United States will take over during this period. You might wonder, well, there's not really any natural resources there. Why in the world would we be taking over these small little islands in the middle of the vast expanse of an ocean? It's for coaling stations. These steamships, the American Navy, is powered by coal during this period. You can only leave port with so much coal in your hold. At some point, you're going to need a friendly port to pull into to refuel, to get food and supplies. So thinking about the growth of American military influence abroad, these small possessions in the middle of the Pacific Ocean are really more for strategic purposes, for military purposes, than anything else. And finally, I want to talk about the missionary impulse or the moral imperative that some Americans felt to go to other areas of the world to proselytize. In other words, we see a number of Protestant missionary societies cropping up in the United States around the turn of the 20th century, many of them advocating for the idea that it was their, they felt, moral duty to spread Christianity and Western culture to other areas of the globe. This is sometimes referred to as the so-called white man's burden, and it takes its name from a poem by Rudyard Kipling entitled The White Man's Burden. And this idea was that Western cultures were supposedly superior to other cultures and that it was the burden or the duty of some of these so-called more advanced cultures to go to other areas of the globe and to Christianize, to teach them a, uh, a Western language, to teach them how to dress as Westerners did in, in an effort to try and quote-unquote civilize these peoples. Needless to say, many of the civilizations that are finding themselves being overrun by Western societies don't feel that they are uncivilized and don't feel that they are in need of being told 
what religion to practice or being told how they should dress, how they conduct themselves, and, and so forth. And we're going to see armed rebellion, in fact, across the globe. The Boxer Rebellion breaks out in China, for instance, around the turn of the 20th century, specifically targeting Western missionaries and targeting Western businessmen. Um, this is a country that has just been overrun, China had been, uh, for years by foreign powers. And they have decided, there were local organization groups that decided that they had had enough, that they wanted to permanently expel foreigners from their midst. It was unsuccessful, and it was brutally repressed by Western forces. Please make sure and listen to the second half of this lecture.